scripture lesson this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, the 12th chapter, uh, beginning in the 9th verse. If you'll hear now these words of God. Uh, Romans 12, verse 9. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love not one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be claimed to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Think with me a few minutes this morning as we think about job descriptions. It's Labor Day, and Ed has already alluded to the fact that Labor Day has its roots in the labor movement in the United States, and and it has its roots in people who work with their hands and who have built this country, and, 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 and that's the what we celebrate this weekend is that, that just dogged determination of the American workforce. I don't know about you, but I, I do my best to find things with that made in the USA label, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see more and more companies that are, who are, are bringing those jobs back home, and men and women who are being given opportunities uh, to be a part of that vital infrastructure of our country. But job descriptions now are are pretty broad. In labor, as we think about going to work, there are a lot of things that people do for work and the many ways which people labor. Paul's little section of his letter to the church in Rome this morning, I really want to go back to the first part of verse 12, um, which is in a previous lection reading where he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. What I read when I read this uh, in, in the context of Labor Day weekend was that this is really a job description. It's an expansion of Jesus saying that, that you've heard the commandments, but I'm going to, I'm going to boil it down to two commandments for, for you. Love God and love your neighbor. And that sounds great. You know, if someone tells us to go do a job and they say to go do it, uh, you know, whatever that job may be. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I mowed grass. And, and the first time you ever mow grass, you you know, you got a mower, and, and you've seen people mow grass, but everybody likes the yards done just a little differently, right? Um, you know, for me, when I'm mowing grass, I, I like nice straight lines, and you, you alternate the pattern each time you mow, and I like a nice crisp edge against the concrete. Some people appreciate a more organic feel. They, they don't mind if the edges of their Bermuda creep into the flower beds or over the edge, and, you know, and some folks... You know, like fescue and some Bermuda and some zoysia and some just have a mix of everything. And so if you're going to cut grass, it it would be nice to know something other than just mow the grass and take care of the yard. That was one of the first jobs that I had. And each client I had had a different way they wanted it done. And I had to know specifically how they wanted it done. 
I, I, I'm, you know, my, my staff will tell you that, that uh, for job descriptions, I pretty much tell them it's whatever it takes to get the job done. And Madeline's looking at me and nodding her head. And, um, but obviously, we each kind of have our areas of responsibility. We each have areas in which we're called upon to act and do. And so I, I, I have to sit down with them, or I have the privilege of sitting down with them, and we talk about how to specifically do that. And I think what Paul is trying to do in this section of his letter to the church in Rome is to be a little bit more specific about what it means to love your neighbor. Because I think we all have this understanding of what love looks like, and, and I, I think Paul may have been trying to help outline it. You know, in, in some parts of Paul's letters, he's responding to a specific issue taking place in whatever community or church that is. Uh, they were arguing about, uh, you know, in, in modern day terms, they were arguing about what color to paint the walls or what the carpet should look like or how the pews should be arranged. I mean, that's essentially what Paul was addressing. But, you know, it was how we're going to worship and how we're going to observe the sacraments and whether we're going to follow any of the Jewish law or not or if we're going to just follow these new laws. And, but when Paul was writing to these churches, he was essentially often he was trying to, to address head-on specific issues. In this section, there are, depending on how you read it and how the English um, is, is, is transcribed and how it is interpreted, um, there, there could be as many as 30 admonitions in here, 30 imperatives, things that you must do, that you absolutely must do. So it seems unlikely that Paul is trying to address 30 different things in one passage. Rather, it seems as though what Paul is doing is establishing for the church an understanding of what it means to be the church. An understanding of what it means to show the love of Christ. And what we have to understand is what our anthem so beautifully spoke of this morning is that it, none of this happens without God's grace and without the gift of Christ. Because all of what Paul is talking about here is in a response to what God has already done for us. And so it says, let love be genuine. And if you remember last week, we were going over the story of Joseph and his brothers. And we, we talked about love and hate being the two sides of the same coin Paul kind of picks up this theme and moves it forward. He says, let love be genuine and hate what is evil and hold fast to what is good. You remember that we, we kind of reviewed John Wesley's and the Wesley brothers' general rules for the church. Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God, attend to the ordinances of God. And so very similar language here of, of hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection and outdo one another in showing honor. I don't know if any of you read a couple of weeks ago that an amazing thing took place at a Starbucks. Early one morning at a Starbucks, a, a, a customer went through the drive through window and they decided that they were going to pay for the coffee of the person who was behind them. And when the person behind them got to the drive through window, the clerk said, someone has paid for your coffee. And that person thought, well, that's pretty amazing. They thought about how great that made them feel. And they said, well, I want to pay for the coffee of the person behind me. Eleven hours later, people were still paying for the coffee of the person behind them. Outdo one another in showing honor. Now, there was an article, and I didn't have time to read it this week. I was trying to look up some of this stuff, and there was an article. Apparently, the guy who stopped it really took a beating because, you know, something happened, and, you know, there's got to be someone who just says, well, you know, I just, I don't really like the person behind me, so uh, I'm just going to pay for mine and move on. And apparently, there was some genuine, legitimate reason for why that person couldn't do so. But 11 hours, people thought about someone behind them that they likely didn't even know. What a wonderful honor, way to honor others. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit and serve the Lord. 
What we also begin to, to realize in this passage is that, that Paul's kind of addressing kind of four groups of people. The first part we're talking about, he's, he's addressing how we treat one another in the church. And we've been dealing with that for the past few weeks, kind of how we treat one another, how we show mutual respect and love for one another, the, the appropriate ways to disagree, the appropriate ways to, to find ways to, to engage in conversation. And he's just kind of expanding upon that a little bit. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, and persevere in prayer. So this first section is all about how we treat each other in the church. And then he begins to expand it just a little bit. Contribute to the needs of the saints and extend hospitality to strangers. So he kind of expands it a little bit. He expands it to the broader Christian community, the saints. And we think of the saints as those that have gone on, but really when we think about the saints, it's the gathering of all Christians everywhere. And as we've acknowledged over the past month, maybe more now than ever in our world, do we need to be in prayer for the saints, for there are saints in this world who are being killed because of their belief in Christ. And we must stand with them. We must pray for them. And we must pray for those who persecute them. For I stand in a pulpit on a Sunday morning without fear of anybody busting through the front doors and coming to haul me off. I give thanks for that privilege and I thank the men and women who have died for me to have that right. But we must be in prayer for all the saints. We, we can't live in our wonderful, safe cocoon of the church in the United States where we can say and do whatever we want to say and do. We must reach out to those around this world and we must welcome them with open arms. Now, I, you know, this probably wasn't too much of a stretch, but it... It's certainly an example of this week. We got an email this week from a, from a church group in Alabama. And they're coming to, to Atlanta this evening to attend Faith Night at the Braves game. Uh, they're going to have a Christian concert following the Braves game. And all of the bus parking was taken up uh, at Turner Field. So they emailed and they asked, could they park their church van here and carry folks over and, or drop everybody off and, and come and park their van here and and then go back in a, in a vehicle that they could park. Obviously, my church folks who come all the time know how much I love sports and how much I love the Braves. And, I mean, if you got a Methodist church group from Alabama coming, you got to give them a place to park, right? May it, well, see, we're not so... Alabama won their first game of the year. Everybody's not too, uh, too keen on, on that right now. But we extend hospitality. More importantly, we extend hospitality to... Uh, every spring there's a group who comes from Appalachian State who stays in our church and they serve in the community of Atlanta and it kind of transitions beautifully when it says serve the Lord and, and extend hospitality to strangers. As I've said before, and my challenge is continues to be on the table. This church being located where it is needs to find more ways to open our doors to those who come and serve in the city. We need to find ways to have space in our building that welcomes them and and nurtures them as they come to our city and seek to serve others. This one group has been very manageable and it's been wonderful to have them, but we have tons of groups who email and call and would like to come and stay in our facility. And as as we continue to work together, I've I've shared this many times, is we talk about a vision for Atlanta First, being a hub where people can come into the city of Atlanta and serve God faithfully. Whether they come and stay or they're coming for a moment, welcoming welcoming them is so important. Now here's where Paul quits preaching and goes to meddling. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. I'd be honest with you as your preacher this morning. In, in the human condition of human conditions, when someone treats you or your family inappropriately, this may be one of the most difficult things to hear or read in this text. And it gets even more difficult. 
live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wise in our. Do not repay evil for evil. It becomes difficult for us because, as I've said so many times, we live in such a polarized world that we have all come, become accustomed to the fact that maybe it's appropriate that we live in this polarized way and that we treat one another in these ways. But Christ and then Paul call us to a higher standard. If we're talking about this being a, a job description for the church, we can love one another, we can serve God, we can welcome strangers most of the time, but now you're asking us to pray for those who persecute us. Now, this, this one quote I, I, I love for a couple reasons, and the most important reason is because um, it's the one time Father Mulcahy really gets aggravated in MASH. Uh, a young soldier has had some money stolen, and, and Father Mulcahy, he founds out about it, and he takes to the, the PA system in the camp, and he's preaching the most fiery sermon that he's ever preached. Because Father Mulcahy is not known to be a very great preacher, but he certainly is known to be a great pastor and to be present with soldiers and doctors and nurses in the midst of very difficult times. But in the, in the height of his sermon over the PA system of the camp, he says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, hoping that whoever had stolen the money would return it in due time. And, and, and his, his, his comrades kind of make fun of him for, for doing that. But, but what I want us to hear this morning is when Paul is quoting this scripture, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, or in this translation, Vengeance is mine, I will repay it, says the Lord. There's a part of us, our human condition wants to go straight to, I don't have to worry about it because God's going to take care of them. But let's remember where we started this sermon, is that it's all about God's grace and it's only in response to what God has done for us. And so really what Paul is doing is flipping and it's on its head and saying, you know, I wouldn't be so quick to want vengeance because vengeance has a way of being blind. And so just the moment we think it's someone else who deserves God's vengeance, we might be careful because it may be we who have something in store. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For in doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Think about this for a moment. Think about being a warden and a jailer in South Africa during apartheid. And think about your most famous prisoner being Nelson Mandela. And then think for a moment when tides turn and Nelson Mandela is being released and is going to be the president of your nation. Think for a moment what it must have felt like to be that warden and to be that jailer. Think of the fear that must have been struck in your heart when you know, uh-oh, I've held this man in jail for all these many years and now he is in the position of power. And what did Nelson Mandela do? One of those men sat on the front row at his inauguration. Another was invited to a state dinner at the occasion of the anniversary of his release from jail. You see, I think Nelson Mandela could have handled that a couple ways, but I think if you read this scripture, you will heap burning coals upon their heads how uncomfortable must it be to sit on the front row at the inauguration of the man who you held prisoner for all those years? How uncomfortable must it be to sit at a state dinner in a place of honor, honoring a man? Now, now the fact is, when you read deeper into the story, Nelson Mandela, many years before, had won over the hearts of his jailers and the warden because of the way he treated them even in his imprisonment. But, but I'm going to tell you, when I hear that story, and when I read this scripture, it all sounds really good. But I promise you that the human condition is difficult to overcome. 
Paul has laid out for us a job description for the church and how to be the church. He's done it to, for us to be the church to the church, to the saints, the expanded church, to our enemies, and to strangers. I mean, we do a pretty good job of being the church to each other most of the time. Less so are we living up to our job description of being the church to the broader Christian community. If we're honest with ourselves, as we get deeper in the job description, uh, we probably couldn't rate ourselves too high on how we treat those who persecute us and with whom we disagree. And strangers, I think it depends on what they look like and how comfortable we are around them as to how well we live up to this admonition and to these imperatives. Paul is setting out a job description for us to be the church. And we have to rise above petty bickering and disagreements and we have to be able to model Christ's love for the world. It will not be easy but it is imperative that we do so. You know, job descriptions often end with, and all other duties as assigned. <laughs> Anybody ever had a job description like that, all other duties as assigned? This one is very specific. And it kind of ends that same way. Do not be overcome by evil, but be overcome with good. It goes back to what we've been talking about for the last few weeks. God loved us and God calls us to love each other. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.